All right, everybody, this is Sheets, and we have a very, very special guest. That would be Justin Goldberg, a.k.a. Goldie, a.k.a. Uh, projection Wizard, a.k.a. former sit-and-go genius, a.k.a. just uh, overall smart guy who you've seen in the Discord in the last couple of months and helping out with the site in a lot of ways. Uh, very passionate about, about DFS, very passionate about baseball, and uh, he and I are going to be going through uh the uh this kind of you know decent little six game slate tonight uh bobby's not with us today so what we're going to be doing is we're both kind of going to be i guess referring to our own projections and our own way of looking at things and as usual even when i do this with bobby justin and i did not talk about the slate at all beforehand we have no idea who each other likes and i think that makes it a lot more real and um and we'll go through it game by game and then we'll talk about our favorite stuff and we'll kind of talk through, you know, um, where we might decide to go. I have a question for you, Justin. We never really talked about this. What 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 type of like what do you play? In other words, I don't want to say amounts or anything like that, but do you like how many lineups do you usually play when you play baseball? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh on the on the bigger slates, I mean, my favorite kind of sweet spot is about the the eight gamers, you know, the eight, nine, ten gamers. I don't mean uh, I don't mean the slate, but I mean how many lineups do you play? Yeah, yeah, slate? and 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 those I I really find that they're they're really really good for tournaments. There's a lot of spots you can get different, so I play a ton of lineups usually. Um, you know I I will I won't max enter, but uh, I I build a hundred teams. Um, just you know easy for me to kind of uh, deal with the numbers that way and that uh okay i, I want 10 15 of this guy is like that that translates all right 15 lineups or whatever and well i, well, I, well, I think that's important for everybody to realize in, in 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 the term of context you know what i mean because when bobby and i talk about our stuff you yeah. know bobby doesn't play that many lineups so when you know when he's talking about different plays it's important people to realize that so you know so so when when, when you're going to be talking about your plays you're going to be talking about it from the perspective of someone who's going to be putting in some stuff and he wants to have a good portfolio of teams and, and he wants to have some leverage against himself in some situations. And, and as you guys might recall, I usually play 30 lineups in baseball. So maybe my approach is going to be, you know, not quite as targeted as Bobby's might be, but not quite as, you know, as, as portfolio based as, as Justin's are. So I think it's important for people to know in context, you know, what, what they're listening to. And I always felt that when I was listening to, you know, other content providers go through who they like, I'm like, okay, that sounds great. But I mean, if you're going to be playing, you know, 150 lineups. You know, if you tell me, oh, this is your favorite, I mean, that doesn't really help me all that much, you know, because um, it's important to put, you know, everybody's opinions in the term of context. So let's, let, let me go, let's, let's just go through it. So, it's already kind of weird to see an Arizona San Diego game be the first game on any slate for that matter, right? Yeah, um, yeah. They're doing so, a so, bunch so, of so, 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 what do you, what do you think? I mean, what do you, what do you think of the pitching? What do you think of the hitting? What, what do you like? I mean, overall on the slate, I mean, I think there's a bunch of different spots that we can go to. Uh, obviously, in the first game here, uh, Snell. Uh, early ownership projections coming in on him as they really always do. He's going to be. Um, you know, very heavily owned. He's definitely the chalk, and I think it's pretty warranted. Um, Arizona strikes out a boatload at you know north of twenty three percent against lefties this season, and despite the fact that they've been a little bit better over the last couple of weeks, you know, with some additions at the deadline or whatever, um, you know, they're still definitely attackable, and and I think it's perfectly fine to to get to Snell. Um, but there are some other options that we have. We'll get to some of the other games, but you know, you can get off of some Snell because he's got a lot of variance built into him and he's, he's got a walk rate North of 10% and he doesn't go that deep into games cause he can't throw strikes, you know? So it's, it's tough to play him a lot of the time, despite the outsized strikeout numbers that you're getting from him. So you can certainly play him. Um, I'm not sure, you know, to kind of, circle back to the number of teams i'll probably only play you know one team tonight you know on the shorter slates i, I do like getting i think it's a lot easier to to really narrow in uh to the best plays and still be able to get different on <clears throat> these types of six gamers so tonight i might only play one team and it, i very well might not have snell on it um because i do think there there's other ways that you can go so um that said if you're building you know 100 teams or whatever 
uh, coming in at, at the field with 40% of Blake Snell, I think is perfectly warranted because uh, the strikeout stuff is just too high. And if you're just outright fading that or coming in far, far underweight at a 10% exposure or whatever, uh, you start to put yourself in an almost negative leverage situations um, with opportunity costs just on the mound since it is a short slate and he's, he's got the highest numbers. So do you think that, do you think that um, Snell in, in, in the, um, in the lineups that you would not play Snell, would would you, would you play Arizona or is it not that important to get that much leverage or is that, or is it one of those types of slates? Like you, would you get to any Arizona? Let's just say you're playing, you know, 30, 40 lineups or something. You think you get to any Arizona in the non Snell lineups or would you be more inclined to, you know, to fade Snell by just playing something, some other pitcher? Well, I, yeah, I, I absolutely would get to Arizona. I got uh, a lot of their hitters. Number one, they're like, they're well-priced. Okay. They're, they're, they strike out a crap load, but um, they're well-priced and there are other expensive arms that you can get to on the mound. Like Heaney will get to um, and Tristan McKenzie, you know, you want to play two teams like that fade Snell and also get some, a little bit of leverage off of him because he walks so many people. I think it's, perfectly reasonable in those scenarios to to get to some Arizona pieces uh that are well priced like uh Christian Walker he's got the most power on the team 4000 it's an excellent price for him Carson Kelly leads off a lot of the time against lefties at 3500 that's a fantastic play um and Emmanuel Rivera at third base 3100 he's been excellent since uh since Arizona acquired him uh at the deadline so um I don't think it's totally necessary on a, on on a day like today in particular, but uh, they're they're perfectly well priced. Cattell Marte is the best hitter on the team, and he hits from the right side too. So if if you're building a bunch of teams, I'm not sure I'd get there in in like a 20 max or something. Um, I just don't think it's necessary. But if you're building 100 150 teams, I think it's it's perfectly reasonable. Because Blake Snell's going to come in at 40, 50 percent ownership, depending on on which tournament you're in, you know. So it's just it's just a natural leverage spot, and he walks so many guys, so he gets into trouble. Um, you know, you're going to want to have some pieces over here that can get into the San Diego bullpen as well. So I think it's perfectly fine to get there. What about um, what about what about San Diego and the hitting? I mean, they're obviously. I mean, I have them as one of the one of the one of the top options. So I guess my question is. Yeah. Two, two prong. Have you ever heard of Ryan Nelson? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is he someone that's worth playing? I mean, yeah, we as well, we only have six games. Did he someone that you got to at 5k at all? Or um, if not, is San Diego one of your top, top stacks? Is that, you know, do you have them rated high ownership wise? You think that they're the number one option where, where, where are you on San Diego? Yeah, absolutely. You got to like the Padres here for sure. Uh, Ryan Nelson. Um, he's just kind of a, a middling sort of, kind of upper triple a quad a type of arm uh he's got he he doesn't throw all that hard and the the swing and miss numbers down in the in the upper minors are not all that impressive we're talking um you know the low 20s strikeout rate and typically when guys come up to the big leagues uh they'll lose two to three ticks off of off of their upper minors strikeout numbers uh and certainly this is an, an awful strikeout matchup um for somebody coming up against it against Padres no matter what right so um yeah I I wouldn't get to any Ryan Nelson in this spot uh I think it's you know we'll get to Hunter Brown here in the next couple of games but he's only 200 more expensive and he's got far far more upside um even if there is a little bit of you know a little bit more variance uh, with the command issues that with Hunter Brown so I wouldn't touch Ryan Nelson here I don't think the strikeout upside uh, is, is all that high again it's about 23 percent give or take in in the minors um so you're looking at, at probably a a below average 20 percent give or take strikeout rate in the majors uh if we had you know if we extrapolate the samples out to and and the matchup here uh, is just horrendous um as far as san diego goes i think you know jury profar his prices come off a little bit i think that's fine leading off he's going to be popular too uh, but Juan Soto, along with Trout, who we'll get to later, probably the top two outfield plays on the day uh, at 5,600 and 5,500 for Trout. Um, but the good news about San Diego, yeah, I do think they are, they're one of the top two stacks. 
the good news as of right now is that they're coming in far, far lower than the Angels, um, who are coming in at about you know twenty to thirty percent, pretty much every one of them. Yeah. Padres, Padres on the other hand, right now are looking at about ten to fifteen percent, and that's just, and that's kind of inflated by a couple of guys like Soto, who are seeing north of twenty percent, or a Cronenworth down here at thirty nine hundred, who is also an excellent play uh, at you know, 12 to 15%. So um, you can, you can get to the Padres and still get incredibly high upside in full stacks, I think, without having to undertake all that ownership that you will with the angels. So I think that's a really good pivot off of um, the major chalk that we're going to see in the Detroit LA game later on. Um and, you know, there's there's some guys here, though, that I think you can fade as well, like a Josh Bell, 4,700. That's probably a little bit expensive. 5,900 Manny is a stiff, stiff price, but um, you can get to him also. I think that's perfectly fine. But um, Ryan Nelson, again, he's not going to blow it by anybody. And this is a just in general against, you know, um, fully stretched out major league arms. Uh, it. it San Diego's a, t- a tough matchup. So, um, yeah, just just the Padres for me and some some short little Arizona pieces uh, where they're well-priced. I would stay off of the lefties since uh, Blake Snell is, like, elite against lefties. But there's there's righties over there that you can play. Carson Kelly mentioned Christian Walker, Manny Rivera, that type of stuff. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, Snell, San Diego. Uh, Snell will be the obvious chalk. San Diego will be played. You know what I mean, but they won't be the as 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 high owned as the as uh, as the Angels. Yeah. So I think we probably you know you're playing one lineup. You could get away with Snell and and the and the and the Padres. I think if we're trying to win the lottery, probably even need to do something a little different. But we'll we'll get to it. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, White Sox Seattle. We have Lynn versus Marco Gonzalez, and I mean at least for me, um, Lynn is is uh, you know very legitimate if not the best uh sp2 i'm not uh i don't know how i refer to hunter brown we're gonna get to him in a little bit yes i actually think that he's like 3k underpriced but 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 um but for now let's let's take a look at lance land i mean he's 70 he's 7900 i have him own you know 25 30 percent something something like that yeah and it certainly makes makes a lot of makes a lot of sense um uh the problem is is that that Seattle's rough, man. Um, uh, Seattle's good. <laughs> they hit the ball, yeah. so so yeah. I um I I wouldn't I wouldn't jump uh jump and trample over people at the mall just to play Lance Lynn against Seattle. But it's, look, it is just kind of a short slate. But I think there are options here besides just going to play Lance Lynn at Seattle. So uh, he does project pretty well for me. Um, I'm not getting to myself to Gonzalez. And as far as the, as, as the hitting goes, and I'll let you take it away in a minute. Um, I really have Chicago is kind of like secondary and it's weird. I mean, I have Seattle here is kind of secondary as well, but I show him them getting low, like no ownership and, and I'll tell you, you know, like for all the reasons I just mentioned, I mean, like, let's listen, this is not very analytical, but Seattle's like, they're not bad. And if Lance Lynn is going to end up, you know, really popular, I, I really don't think he, I, I, I really think that everybody's going to play Snell and Hunter and Hunter Brown at the end of the day. Okay. But if yeah. not, um, I think Lynn is going to, if Lynn ends up really popular and you're looking for some kind of leverage, I think you could do worse than play Seattle. Now it's not certainly not going to be based on, just the numbers and, and straight projections, but if I'm overlapping projections with with ownership, I think it's not bad. Um, this is going to be one of those spots where I'm going to run a Sabreson build that's going to give me zero Seattle, and I'll end up having to probably force in a little if I want to do it. Yep. Um, and interestingly, Justin, I mean, one thing I've been noticing is Seattle always seems to be low owned. Um, yeah, and and so uh, I'll you know they got they got guys that can hit. Now look, it's they're obviously I prefer all the Seattle guys against the lefty. Right. Um, except for Winker, but but um and 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 Lynn is pretty freaking tough against righties, but hey, that's why that's why they're gonna be five percent on each, I guess. So for me, I, I definitely think Lynn's a good play. Uh and I 
think that Chicago and Seattle are both kind of fringy, you know, fringy, fringy pivot stacks to say the least. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree pretty much across the board with you, uh, Lynn. I'm showing coming in, you know, roughly thirty percent now, and that's he's definitely going to be one of the chalk SP twos. If I mean, in some tournaments, certainly in single entry, he's going to be far higher than that. Um, in you know, in, in stuff like the relay or whatever, like he'll probably come in pretty close to this thirty five percent or so. And and I think that's fine to get leverage off of him. Um, and and in fact, in his last start, which blew up in my face, I played a bunch of ball or the the Royals against him, and uh, you know that didn't go well. But um, you know, so he does have upside, and and coming in with good exposure to Lance Lynn, I think is perfectly warranted as well because he does have uh, enough stuff to neutralize the right side of the plate. And as you mentioned, most of Seattle's good hitters are hitting from the right side and um but that said you know this is six game slate and you play anybody against everybody um and if he's going to be that popular he still does have significant weaknesses to the left side and he's really only got effectively three pitches and they're all fastballs right so if he is coming in um you know at at 40 percent in some single entry tournaments i think it's perfectly warranted if you don't want to play the Arizona because Blake Snell is is you know pretty good then I think it's perfectly fine to get off some chalk elsewhere and fade Lance Lynn play a couple Seattle pieces you can always play Julio up at the top and I think this is a a big reason why they always come in so you know, so ignored right. by the field is because Julio's 6,300, you know, that's, <laughs> it's like, uh, that's stiff. That's hard. He's like, he's like 700 more than Mike Travis. Yeah. Yeah. It's out of control, but the guy gets on and he, and he steals bases. He's got plenty of power. Um, and he's leading off, you know, so he's going to get at bats far more than the, the, you know, everybody else. So, um, but I really do like Seattle as a as a good leverage stack here. I wouldn't get crazy with them necessarily because the pricing does make it kind of hard if you do want to get up top, just like some Snell McKenzie or some Snell Heaney teams or something like that. Um, but I think some three mans here, like Ty France is a good, good hitter. Yeah. You can play him at, at first base. Nobody's going to play him down here. Um, I, I'm showing him at two percent own ownership right. as of, as yeah. of right now. You know, forty three hundred. That's an excellent price for him. Um, now you, you will run into some strikeout issues, as you mentioned against, against righties over here. So that's why I wouldn't go crazy with the exposures to Seattle, but I think it's perfectly fine to get to the top five guys. You can play Cal Raleigh. He's an excellent catcher play. He's, he's great. He He's fantastic. He's got a ton of power yeah. against the right side and Lance Lynn's biggest weakness is against lefties. So, uh, he's a really, really good play. It, it's stiff to play a catcher in the eight hole on a home team at 4,000 a lot of the time, just because you're sacrificing so much in, um, in at bat equity, number of at bats a lot of the time, because if, if Seattle does get to them, get to Lynn, and it, or this is like a three, two game or whatever, going into the ninth inning, you know, Cal Raleigh could very well only get three at bats. Right. So a lot of the time you do, I, I really don't like going there, but you know, if you're getting to full Seattle stacks or even like short little three mans or whatever, I think it's perfectly fine to play a Julio, Ty France, and a Kyle Raleigh or a Winker France Raleigh or something like that. You get some leverage off the field. All right, I'll let you start with Texas Houston. Yeah, Texas Houston here, I think is a really, really interesting spot, actually. And as you mentioned, the Hunter Brown is going to come in. Um, he's one of the top prospects for, for Houston. Uh, kid has a lot of gas in the tank. He's got plus plus velocity and he's got four pitches that he can use uh the issue as is kind of common with a lot of guys that come up from the minors with this type of velocity is is command is being able to control the baseball and throw strikes so that's really where the variance is going is going to introduce itself with hunter brown um but he is no doubtedly the the best option you know point per dollar on the day um, and, and really in terms of value as well at 5,200, I, I agree with you. I think he's well, well underpriced for the potential upside. Texas strikes out at about a 23, 24% clip. 
against right-handers this season. And, and this guy has a 30% K rate in the upper minors. Uh, he does have an 11% walk rate. And similarly to, uh, you know, what I mentioned in the Arizona game, how strikeout rates tend to decrease when you get up to the bigs walk rates also tend to increase uh, a lot of the time if you can't throw strikes because you know hitters are just better and they're more disciplined so that's where the variance is going to come from but he's he's just underpriced as well um and he should be 7200 at the very least here so um i like him but again he's going to be 30 40% 40% ownership. You'll probably see him push 50% in higher stakes, uh, single entry type of stuff. So be careful with that, but there's no doubt that he is the most upside here. Uh, on the other side though, I, I kind of like Martin Perez. I hate playing the guy and I don't, I'm not crazy about the price. I don't like playing guys against Houston. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that acts against them, but He's suppressed contact very, very well this season. He's got a five to six pitch mix and he keeps hitters off balance. Um, And if we're looking for contrarian options, you know, we really have the few chalk options, Snell, Hunter Brown, Lance Lynn, Heaney, whatever. Martin, if you want to play some chalk stacks like the Angels or whatever and the Padres, then I think throwing in a Martin Perez at 3% ownership is perfectly warranted. He can absolutely survive six, seven innings here, even against a team that doesn't strike out. So this isn't a strikeout play necessarily, uh, or a price value play necessarily. It's more of a more of an ownership weighted play that you could get to uh, with Martin Perez on the mound. Um, but I also like looking at the other side, and it, when I'm deciding whether to when to play pitchers, and to kind of take maybe a a negative value spot with Martin Perez against Houston. I mean, look at the pricing over against, you know, on the other side, you got Jose Altuve at 5,700. You've got Jordan at 5,800, Bregman 54, Kyle Tucker 51. Like it is not easy to get to these guys and the cheap guys, you don't really want to play, right? Yuli Gurriel doesn't have any power. Trey Mancini hits in the seven hole and who knows if he's even going to start, you know, um, and Jeremy Pena strikes out at like a 35% clip, you know, so it's, it's kind of a hard team to stack. And we're seeing kind of a, a suppressed total from Houston in that regard, despite the fact that they don't strike out and they're seeing a lefty on the mound that doesn't strike people out, you know? So I think it's a really interesting spot to get to some Texas uh, or to some Martin Perez. Um, and again, Hunter Brown's going to be owned. So Texas is, it's an all right baseball team over here. And they got one of the best hitters in the league and Corey Seager over there. So uh, I think you can get to some three man Texas. I wouldn't full stack them necessarily uh, because Houston's bullpen is really, really good. Probably the best in the league, but I like getting to Marcus Semyon. 51 is perfectly gettable. Uh, Nate Lowe has been excellent over the last month at 4,200. I think he's perfectly gettable and 5,800 Corey Seager. As I said, he's, one of the best hitters in in the game. So, um, you know, some short three man little pieces from Texas, maybe some Martin Perez for me. And I'm really kind of off the Houston offense, uh, but I do like Hunter Brown. So, um, you know, that's really it for me. So a couple of things on that. First of all, um, uh, you mentioned two statistics, which I wanted to kind of hop on a little bit. You mentioned um, Hunter Brown strikeout rate uh, and also uh, Texas's strikeout rate. And, and, yep. and, and uh, one thing about about that is that you you usually do need two two to tango in that type of thing. You know what I mean? And and, and when you do have both the strike the, the pitcher with the strikeout rate and the team with the strikeout rate, that's that's a pretty powerful combination normally. You know, yeah. um, and, and and yes, you do have the issue of whether that strikeout rate is going to you know, obviously you're going to translate into the majors you know, the majors are, are, are just different, you know, but I think that would be a reason why he would, he would be 7,800 instead of 86. You know what I mean? Like, I think mm-hmm. at 52 is just kind of ask, you know, it's just, I just think it's too cheap. Now with that said, a couple of things going on here. First of all, uh, if I were teaching someone how to play GPPs, I, I would, I would give, use this as, as, as kind of like one of the first lessons about why you're supposed to play teams like Texas, right? As far yep. as far as hitting goes, because you have this guy who is who has brings brings the heat. 
very volatile because you throw it. When, listen, when you throw it so hard, you know what I mean? It's going to be all, listen, and, and, and you're making your major league debut, you're going to be naturally nervous. And those types of situations always carry quite a bit of variance. And, and when you have that type of variance coupled with a, a really high ownership uh, percentage, then these are the types of pitches you're just supposed to play some lineups against if you're playing multiple lineups. If you're playing one lineup, you could certainly make the argument that, you know what, I'm just going to play that lineup with Hunter Brown because if I'm playing only one lineup, I'm naturally going to be ahead of the field, right? Because I'll have 100% of everybody, right? So so, so, so you, can, you can get away with that. But if you're playing multiple lineups, even as many as – as few as 10, I think that you should probably make sure to get a Texas stack in there. And Now, on the other hand, you also made a very, very good point about – the, the fact that Houston has a good bullpen probably tempers the amount of players you want to use in that stack. You don't necessarily have to play a five man stack to prove your point. You know what I mean? Like you, you get a couple of, you get, you, you get like back to backs, you know, you get a couple of walks and then you get back to back home runs out of Garcia and, 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 uh, and Seeger, for example, you know, like then you're, they're your goal. You know, you, you don't need to put the pressure on yourself to have a full five man stack kind of come through for you, you know? So, so I think it's important that, that you, that you do get, you know, that, that Hunter Brown is probably the best play, but, but if you're playing, I think 10 or more lineups, I think you do want to get some Texas. The other thing I will say is that I am, um, uh, I, I'm not going to be playing Martin Perez. and I'm not going to be going against him, stacking against him either, but I would say that those two righties that you mentioned are, are, are worth playing as one offs or even as two men. Um, that being Mancini and Pena, the two guys you mentioned, and yes, yep. Uh, yep. Mancini is you know he doesn't have the greatest um, greatest batting spot in the order, and you know whatever, but but I, and Pena strikes out a lot, but but I'm not worried about Perez striking me out, you know. So so uh, if I, I was going to play Houston, I would actually go if I was going to play Houston, I, I I would take shots at those those two dudes, you know, because Houston, listen, Houston, that, that stadium at home, I mean, it just seems as though left field is 200 feet. You know what I mean? Maybe it isn't. It just certainly yeah. feels that way though. Whenever I'm watching righties up at the plate, you know, and, and Mancini's kind of found it over there. So I do like those guys a little bit. Um, and I'm not getting to anything else in Houston. So for me, Hunter Brown, certainly the best, you know, best point per dollar play on the slate. Definitely. I would think in, in, in my, if I was playing one lineup, I'd probably play him. Um, along with Snell and then try to do something funny. Um, but um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Let's uh, move on to Cleveland, Kansas City. I guess I'll start with this one. Um, so we have, uh, wow, we have, we have two uh, two guys with some stuff. You know, we got, we got McKenzie and Singer. And, and um, how did Singer do in his last? Oh, he did not do well. Oh, very, very I'm very glad I avoided that. Um because Singer is 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 a very interesting case study because I, I talk about this with Bobby quite a bit. And whenever you have these younger guys that have like kind of a fishy history in this first year or so or two, but all of a sudden just have numbers come out of nowhere, what ends up happening is that the projection models don't catch up uh, for good reason. I mean, the way the way the way projection models work is that is they 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 look for like a big sample size before they you know overweight you know your most recent performances. But the thing is, is with these young guys, I mean, their they're, 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 they're physical development's volatile. Their learning is volatile. Look, the chance that Zach Granke finds something in the season is zero. You know, the chances that Dallas Keuchel, guy who rests his soul, can find something in this latest career <laughs> is zero. But yeah. the guy, the guys like Singer and even McKenzie, guys like this, I mean, these are the guys that are going to outpitch their projection for a while before they catch up. So. I think that Singer is like one of those guys that's kind of in play every day. The only issue with Singer is his matchup today sucks. You know, like Cleveland just doesn't really strike out that much. So I'm probably going to avoid him. But 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 I just want to you know, bring that up. Tristan McKenzie is, 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 I think, a pretty damn good GPP play because it's a ridiculous price. You know, yeah. he's 10-7 he's on a slate where Blake Snell is 10-2 at home, you know, and, He's 10-7 on a, on, a, on a slate where Lance Lynn, you could argue Lance Lynn is going to score more fantasy points or whatever. So 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 he's – no, I think he's going to be significantly lower owned um, than – than I don't want to say they should be because maybe he shouldn't be the high owned. But 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 he's going to be low owned because of this price. And listen, I've seen some – I've seen some 30s in here. I think I might see a 40 in here. There's a 40 on his recent resume, a 35 on his recent resume. I mean, these are numbers that on a short slate, 
you're just going to want, you know, if it comes in, you know, um, will it come in? I don't know. But, but I definitely think that he is legitimately in play. Um, and with, with Cleveland and, and this, these hittings, uh, the, the hitting side, I'm not really, am I getting to any of these? I have this. No, I, I didn't think so. I'm really not getting to much of the hitting here as, either. So, so for me, I, I do kind of like McKenzie a little bit here. Um, just because it seems so ridiculous to play him. Like, how can you play Snell and McKenzie when there's like Lynn and, and Hunter, 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 whatever his name is, Hunter Brown with such great values. I mean, what are you going to do? Well, I, you know, you gotta, you have to pay down for hitting, which, which I might, I might end up doing. I don't know. Um, so I, I'm interested to hear your take on McKenzie and, and the rest of this game. Yeah. I, uh, I'm kind of on the same, same page with you um McKenzie you can start with him like kids he's one of these young pitchers that had major major issues when he first came up and it was the walk rate he had like a 14 percent walk rate for a full season's worth of work it, like it was just egregious he was thrown into the backstop it, you know twice every at bat so he really dialed into walk rate and he's been excellent this season uh the K stuff is still there the real issue for McKenzie is that, um, you know, despite the K stuff, he's got about a 29% K rate to lefties, 23% to righties. So he is a fly ball pitcher that kind of gets on the barrel a little bit. And with just two plus pitches at 95 or however hard he throws, his fastball is, is a little bit straight. So that makes him a little bit susceptible to same handedness hitters, uh, which is why you see a little bit of a decreased strikeout rate. And he does have, you know, a quite notable uh, 202 ISO against right handers this season with a freaking 50% fly ball rate, you know, so he is susceptible, but not in the typical way with, you know, against lefties. Um, You know, the good news for him is he gets the Royals and they don't really have a ton of power all that much. Um, but they're sneaky and they're, they're definitely capable. Their best hitter is Salvi uh, behind the plate. And he's a, you know, his main weakness is striking out. Um, but Tristan McKenzie's far decreased strikeout rate makes him a little bit more in play Salvi than in perhaps on, on a different day. Um, but overall, yeah, I agree with you in terms of a DFS play. Like ten seven is an egregious price. It is way way too high for him. Um, but that said, he is only going to come in at about half of the ownership of Blake Snell. So it does naturally just make him a really really good tournament play, just to get off some of the the ownership there because his walk rate, despite his pr- problems early in his career, is still far lower than Blake Snell's, uh, who's had walk rate problems his entire career. So. I, I do like getting to some McKenzie if you're building a bunch of teams. Even in a single entry, I think it's perfectly fine to go to him. Now, making it, you know, making a, a build with a Snell and McKenzie, as you alluded to, might be a little difficult. Uh, but there's plenty of value still that you can that you can get to. On the other side, Br- with Brady Singer, I like playing this kid too. Um, he's really kind of figured it out as well, and he's he's excellent to the left side of the play. He's got a 30% strikeout rate against lefties. So we've got some interesting spots that we can attack with him as well. His price is also kind of elevated. So, it, you know, you're not excited when you click this button with Brady Singer here, but um, I think it's perfectly fine because he's, he's got a freaking two, two and a half to one ground ball rate uh, to the right side of the plate, which allows him to, you know, if he does get in trouble, to some of the lefties from Cleveland who are definitely going to platoon against him. Jose Ramirez, Stephen Kwan, Andre Jimenez type of guys. Um, he still has outs to, to get out of those types of jams. Uh, and he's not going to walk anybody. So he's not going to beat himself, which puts him in play. So he may have a little bit of, of decreased upside at his particular price compared to some of the other guys, the Lance Lins, whatever. But he's certainly got more upside than Martin Perez, you know, in in terms of strikeout rate, um, just in general. So I like 
I, I think you can certainly get to him definitely in 20 max. I, I, I would stay off of him probably in a single entry just because like you said, the matchup just sucks. Um, you know, Cleveland's got a 17 and a half percent K rate against, against righties this year. It's just, it's the best in baseball, you know, so really, really hard to get there in terms of pure strikeouts, but they're also not a very good team and they don't hit for a ton of power. So um, not too often are you going to get beat unless the guy just doesn't have it. And he's, you know, floating the fastball or whatever. And guys are just, you know, having batting practice so uh, i think he's a perfectly fine tournament play as well he's also going to come in very very um low owned and i'm showing him sub 10 percent as well um also not going to project great because of the the matchup but um you're exactly right in that these projection systems are more heavily weighting uh, a lot of sort of season-long projection systems when they don't have a lot of actual data and a lot of the season-long projection systems uh, are still pretty low on some of these guys that are, you know, rookie or second year in the majors. So I think it's perfectly fine to get to them. Um, and for the same reason that you can play both of these guys, you, you can also fade both of them because they're young and they're still pretty volatile. So you can get to some short pieces from Cleveland. Uh, I mentioned the, um, the, the lefty split. For, for Brady Singer, he's significantly worse to the left side of the plate, uh, despite a you know an elevated K rate. Boy, what uh, he just gives up far more power to the left side. So um, he's certainly attackable. And same thing with McKenzie on the other side. You can attack him, as I mentioned, the, the righties uh, from, from Kansas City. Now, 6,200 or, or whatever Bobby Witt is coming in, 60. Yeah, sixty two hundred. That is a ridiculous price for him. He got a thousand dollar price bump in the last three days for some reason. So, uh, I'd be careful with with stuff like that. Even though the kid's a good hitter and I really really like him, we do still have to. You know, the most important metric in DFS is price, right? And and what we're paying for these commodities on a daily basis. So, do have to be mindful of that. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like a leverage bot to get to the Royals. But you can you can play a one off here or there. Uh, some of their guys have power. Nick Prado, Michael Massey. Um, these are top prospects for these guys, and they're cheap. So if you if you need a value piece here or there, nobody is going to play them. And I, I think they're definitely playable, um, despite some you know some some low probability spots if you need to get there. But uh, I think overall, I would I would side with. Uh, McKenzie and just some little pieces of Cleveland, uh, like a Jose Ramirez. Always, I like Josh Naylor here, thirty nine hundred. He's similar to Ty France in that nobody's gonna play him, and he's super cheap, and he's got a lot of upside in this spot. So, um, I think that's a really good play. Uh, but I would probably stay off most everybody else in the lineup due to either price or matchup concerns. Um, maybe some Brady Singer. And maybe a couple of short Royals pieces like a Salvi Perez or Michael Massey type of thing. But that's that's really it for me there, too. Detroit, uh, L.A. I guess I'll, I'll start again. Um, so here's the thing. You know, I did some builds earlier today. And if, if you want to play um, uh, McKenzie and Snell together, what you're going to end up getting is a whole bunch of the Tigers. Yep. Um and you're going to have to decide whether that's something that you want to do because, because Suarez is, you know, he's, he's, he's in the league, not for anything, you know, great, but he, he manages damage. He, he, you know, he's, he doesn't really give up all that many runs. You know, I looked at his, it's even game log him. I mean, just, he's like, let's just look through it. I mean, like, look at these runs, two, three, three, zero, one, you know, he's got like one five run game against the Dodgers or six against the Dodgers. So it's not like you're, you're asking for trouble now. Now, again, it's a short slate and believe me, I've won slates like this before where I just pile on the two pitchers points and get just enough to, to eke out like a, like 105 points. And that ends up winning. And that and not every slate's like that, but but you get a slate like that, you can get away with it. And I get guys in like Detroit with like get six fantasy points. That's good enough, you know. But but you're just the the, the mid range pitchers are just strong enough where I don't think that 
th that's what you're going to want to do. But but I, I just to let you know, I, I did build some Sabres and lineups. I'm getting like 50% Tigers because they want me to play these two pitchers. The Tigers are going to project as good points per dollar play, but just don't see that ceiling, that upside from them. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Um, the Angels, uh, well, speaking of Suarez, by the way, um, we, we usually like to target righties, righty pitchers against Detroit. But look, I mean, like I said, I mean, Suarez has been very, very serviceable all season. He's only 7K. Um, and the Tigers, while they're batting as righties, it doesn't mean they're that great against lefties either, you know. So um, I think that he's kind of a cool little pivot off of off of Hunter Brown and and, and these other guys. Um, again, you got to go. You got to take me down the list of lineups to get there. But but he certainly is on my list. And the Angels, I mean, listen, I'll, I'll you, you can tell me what you want. I, the Angels have been the worst hitting team, okay? <laughs> like, they have just been the, the, the nut low the whole season. And and now, all of a sudden, you're getting them at 100% ownership, including a $6,400 player, okay? Yeah, it's out of control. Uh, Otani. Um, and... and um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I could do it. Now the thing is, it's it's a thousand degrees there, and wind blowing out. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's, it's it's certainly a good 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 vibes out there. But wh where exactly are they scoring the eight runs? You know what I mean? I I just yep. don't. I just don't know. All of a sudden, why this is going to be the case? Well, I could just go, go play the Dodgers against a completely freaking semi crippled Logan Webb, it seems. Yeah. And and just with the same weather, with guys that I know are good throughout the lineup. I mean, I don't know. Um, but look, look, let's go back to the projection. The Angels do rate to be the top play. They rate to be the top owned and all of it. I I I I I don't know if I can do it. So so for me it's Suarez is a good play. I probably won't play. Suarez is an okay play I probably won't play. And the Angels look like a great play that I probably won't play. And the Tigers look like like kind of a shitty play that I might play. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at in this game. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of with you. Uh, it's really tough to stomach. Like, by every metric that you look at offensively, whether versus lefties versus righties, the Angels are just terrible. They are so, so bad. That said... Tyler Alexander on the mound for the Tigers yep. is why they're seeing so much ownership here. Okay. Tyler, Tyler Alexander is not going to blow it by anybody. He has a 12, 13% strikeout rate. And very clearly, that's how you attack the Angels. Okay. You know, if they can't make contact, right, then they're not going to they're not going to be able to to put up any runs. Right. And obviously Trout is back now. And they also have a very sticky piece back healthy again up at the top of the lineup david fletcher this guy doesn't strike out at all okay so he that that's really what those two guys bringing them back that's really why they they, they won more games in the yankees last month okay so like yeah. shockingly somehow and that's really what makes this lineup tick and really why they're seeing so much ownership so but i'm with you they're terrible in aggregate and like I would not be shocked if Tyler Alexander comes out and has the best start of his major league career tonight against the Angels. Three get three games ago, he pitched six in against the Angels, three earned runs, seven hits, got a win. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and it's and, not great, but you know. And that's that's enough to kill all of your Angels. All of them. <laughs> every single one of them. But that said, I did mention earlier, Trout is by far the best play of the day, and he and yeah. the ownership on yeah. him is is going to reflect that. Yeah. Uh, he'll be he'll be probably sixty percent in some upper stakes, uh, single entry stuff. Yeah, you know, and he should be because Tyler Alexander is not going to throw it by him. And really, this season, Trout's only weakness has been the the elevated strikeout rate because he's been out of lineup so long, right? But you know, that said. He and Fletcher, as I mentioned, really make this lineup tick. When Fletcher doesn't strike out at the top of the list and he elevates a pitch count for a starting pitcher, then you got to go through Trout, and then you got to go through Otani. And Taylor Ward, he has only a 22% strikeout rate against lefties as well. So Luis Renjifo, he is also pretty sticky. He switch hits, and, and he's got a little bit of pop. And Joe Adele, who historically has struck out a truckload, 
he has dropped his strikeout rate way, way, way down. Okay. And you got a, a catcher down there in Max Stasi with power, right? At a super cheap price tag. So it's a combination of all of these things that Alexander's not going to beat you all that often. So it's so much less likely that the Angels can really beat themselves, right? And, you know, th those couple of guys at the top of the lineup just really make it tick. So I think the ownership is warranted. It's probably going to come in a little bit inflated. Um, and to your point, that's, that's the perfect opportunity to stay off of the Angels and, and just go elsewhere. Go play the Padres at half the ownership in probably a better spot, to be quite honest. Um, I think the way I would approach the angels before we even get to Jose Suarez, sure. You could play correlation pieces with your five man stacks. You know, that, that sort of combination allows you to get a little bit different. Um, but that also means that Jose Suarez's ownership does get kind of inflated due to people wanting to play the angels as well. Right. So all of these things kind of tied together, but how I would approach it is I would play, um, I play some like three mans or even four mans. I like playing four man stacks on shorter slates like this because still not a lot of people do it. They just jam in the five man and 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 run it. Um, so I think picking out the best plays, maybe fading Shohei at thirty plus percent ownership and sixty four hundred, is a way to to get different in your angel stacks or play play Joe Adele who's going to be maybe ten to fifteen percent as opposed to. 35% or, or or something like that. So there are, there are ways you can uh play Matt Duffy. I mean don't play Matt Duffy, he's terrible, but um you can do it because he's 2100 and he's going to be 5 6% owned in a stack that's projected to score a lot. So it's it's definitely possible to get different with them, but they're 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 still the number one stack of the day and I do like them in single entry stuff. I think Getting just playing trout and eating the ownership and getting different elsewhere is probably the best play. Um, but you can play Taylor Ward in the outfield. You can play David Fletcher. You can play Renjifo. All all of these guys are are absolutely in play. But and to your Tigers point, I think you can also get off some of the Jose Suarez, who's going to be kind of chalky at twenty five percent, give or take. Um, play playing Eric Haas at thirty three hundred behind the plate instead of Max Stasi on the other side. I think that's an excellent play. Really, really good pivot, and he's got more power. And the ballpark plays up right hand, or yeah, right handed power a little bit more than left handed power. So, you know, there are some things you can get in into here with the weeds. Uh, and Detroit, um, it would probably take me playing 50 teams or something to get there personally, just because they're they're terrible. But to your point, they are a break even ball club in terms of run creation against left handers this year. Uh, and on the slate today, they're right smack in the middle. So there are worse teams that you could play split adjusted than, than Detroit tonight. So there's some pieces that you can get to. So we go to the San Francisco Dodger game. And if, if Bobby were here, um, I know what he would tell me. Um, and I, I'm, I want to, I want to talk through this myself a little bit. First of all, um, neither of these pitchers um, on a projection basis. Well, I shouldn't say that. Haney rates to be an okay, like second or third option or whatever it is. And Logan Webb is way down the list right now. So if Bob were, he, he would remind me that, that Logan Webb really owed the Dodgers at the end of last season. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. That sounds, 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 sounds fair. Um, and then we look through the, the, the game log of this year and, and listen, I remember those two, those, the, 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 that lemon that he had, uh, uh, when I needed him against Arizona. And then I saw in his next game against at Detroit, he was basically pitching a perfect game through three and barely made it out of the, didn't even make it out of the fifth. Okay. Um, and however, okay. Surrounding all of that are some pretty good games. I mean, he had 24 fantasy points to get the Padres. He had a gem against the pirates. Yeah. You know, then he had 20 as a couple of lemons, but he throws some couple of good ones from time to time. And it's like a ridiculous thing to do. It's like a hundred degree weather out there. But I mean, if you want something different, I mean, let's put it this way. I will have played worse plays than Logan Webb. If I play him, um, yep. that that's all I'll say. Uh, now, Andrew Haney, I mean, he, he is someone who, you know, who he can, he can bring it, you know? And, uh, and what I will say is that the, the hundred degree weather and wind or whatever else is going on out there in, in LA 
it's certainly going to hurt Haney more than it will Webb, you know, because Haney has, had, well, you know, gives up a lot of home runs, you know, when, when he's not right. Or not when he's not right, when somebody gets a hold of one, right? Um, where Logan Webb's not exactly like that. So, so, so I do think the weather is a little bit more anti Haney and, and, uh, I, um, just be careful when you, if, if, if Haney becomes too chalky. I don't think he will. I think it's still it's just going to be Snell Brown, Snell Lynn, whatever. I think Haney could be kind of like everybody's kind of like sneaky pivot off of Snell, maybe. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I want to do with that. Um, again, it's just going to come down to how many lineups I play. Listen, if I play 30 lineups and I get to him, so, you know, by, by accident, I'll, I'll live with it. But I'm not going to say, ooh, I don't have any Andrew Haney. I better play some. Um, and with respect to the hitting, um, as I just kind of alluded to, if you want to play a couple of one-offs from San Francisco just for fun, in case, you know, in case the home runs rear their ugly head, I got no problem with that. Um, but I, I think that uh, I think the Dodgers are, are I think, I just think they're a better play than the Angels. I, I don't know why. Listen, Logan Webb is certainly a better pitch than Tyler Alexander, like you said. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but I think the Dodgers up and down the lineup and, and and considering that Logan Webb, I think he's, I think he's been, listen, he's shown flat, he's shown some good stuff this year, but overall, I think it's been, he's been pretty pedestrian. So I don't know, maybe, 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 you know what, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Dodgers are not of everything. Maybe they're about the same. So I don't know. Um, So for me, um, ah, I'm just still not sure. I mean, I, I'm not going to make either of these, my, either of these pitch my priority. Although the Logan Webb thing, I'll say this, if I play, it guys in these 640 games and it seems to be kind of a struggle or whatever it is. And I need a little bit of juice. I will swap whatever I have for Logan Webb in that last yeah. game. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like if I play, you know, I don't know, but how do I swap that? You know what I mean? I, I will have already had committed to like Lynn or Lynn or Hunter Brown early and Snell early. The only thing I would do, I guess if I had Haney somehow, in a lineup and wasn't doing well, I would swap that probably to Webb, um, and then and then then pay up for something else. I don't know. I don't know what I want to do with this game. Well, what do you what do you think, Justin? Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with you. Uh, it, you know, you agree with fun. me. I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, well, with the Logan Webb, I mean, I I went through it myself this morning and I said, Jesus, this is a, this is disgusting. Uh, but the price at 7,600 for Logan Webb, he has upside at that number. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really the, the issue here, despite like, this is the Dodgers. You don't want to attack the Dodgers. Let's, let's get real. But you know, like Dodgers can be attacked. Okay. Like DeGrom did like torch these guys. All right. And Sandy Alcantara threw a complete game against them. All right. So, like Logan Webb, of course, doesn't have the same stuff as these as those. Yeah, you basically other... just told me the two best pitchers in the major leagues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. you know, don't get me wrong here, but you know, Logan Webb has a two point seven to one ground ball to fly ball ratio. Okay, so he can suppress fly balls, which allows him to, despite the decreased strikeout rate, he's only got about a twenty two percent K rate or whatever this year. That's Lee average. The ground ball rate allows him to survive deep into games, right? And and he keeps the baseball down in the strike zone, so it's so much harder for guys to get it up in the air and, and hit it over the wall. Now, as you said, it's freaking 95 degrees in L.A. and, you know, first week of September. I don't think this has ever happened. So, and the batted ball-wise, the Dodgers, they they hit balls in the air. So it's not an excellent batted ball kind of matchup for Logan Webb. Um, but as you kind of alluded to, like he comes out and he competes against the Dodgers in particular, you know, the, these two teams, they, they really don't like each other and, and they come out for it every day. So I'm not much of a narrative guy necessarily, but um, you know, we get down to, to these types of games, like Dodgers are the best team in baseball and ev they get everybody's best every day. Yeah. Um, that said, like Logan, Logan, he's just too cheap. His price, you've been paying ninety five hundred for him all season, and now he's down to seventy six hundred because he's had a couple of clunkers or whatever. I mean, the price is just too cheap. That doesn't mean I want to go play him, right? Because the, the Dodgers still don't strike out a lot. They're still the best team in baseball. But on the other side, that that also doesn't necessarily mean that I want to play the Dodgers, right? Because it's like sixty five hundred Mookie, sixty one hundred Freddie Freeman, fifty seven. 
like to play a full Dodger stack, like you have to double punt on the mound. Yeah. And that's it. Now you're in the Jose Suarez Hunter Brown territory. And yeah, but you could do that. No. Yeah. 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 You absolutely can. But now you're introducing yourself to a hell of a lot more variance than than the variance, you know, you can survive with a zero from a hitter. You cannot survive with a zero from a pitcher. Yeah, but you, I don't know, man. You could play, if you play Lynn and Hunter Brown, for example, you're 4,600 a player. I mean, yeah, like, you can, you can definitely get it with a, a cheaper secondary stack or something. You can absolutely get there. Um, but again, like Logan Webb, he got beat up pretty good in his last couple outings, I think. And maybe his last outing was, was pretty all right. But um, in, in general, I don't like attacking the Dodgers. Uh, of course, but he's he's playable in in deeper tournaments. I think I would certainly not get to him in a single entry. Like I don't think you need to take that kind of risk. But he's playable in a twenty max, I think, and because this is such a short slate. And with Andrew Heaney on the other side, like you alluded to it, um, he gives up a lot of fly balls. And Andrew Heaney's problem his entire career has been hard contact and fly balls. And that is not a good recipe when you're playing 100 degree weather, um, with slight winds blowing out to center field. Another issue we're going to run into with Heaney is that we're in September now, and despite his kind of outside strikeout stuff at north of 30 percent this season, did he very well? Like he plays for the Dodgers, and the Dodgers start playing their their late season pitcher nonsense games where they start yanking guys after 62 pitches and, and then you got to deal with the bullpen <laughs> right. when they want to, when they want to rest everybody going into the playoffs, you know? So that's another concern. And at 9,600, right. that, that's all another risk that you got to kind of be aware of as far as the batted ball profiles, like this matchup, actually it sets up pretty well for the giants and some of their platoon bats. Now I'd be careful playing a lot of Austin Slater because he is one of those guys that they do platoon pretty heavily. Um, so he'll he could very well get two ABs and they yank him for a a, a Lamont Wade, you know, in the fifth inning or or whatever. Um, so you kind of need him to get there early in the game. And with hand with Heaney's strikeout stuff, as strong as it is, it's it's kind of hard. So that's another risk that you're introducing yourself to. But Wilmer Flores, he plays the entire game. Evan Longoria, he will play the entire game if he's in the in the lineup, right? So right. and these guys are 4,100, 3,500, and they have a boatload of power. And again, Andrew Heaney's main problem is he only has two pitches. He throws them right down the freaking middle and and sees if guys can can hit it. Right. And, and oftentimes they do, <laughs> you know. So the Giants in in short little one off pieces, I think. Evan Longoria is a fantastic third base play at 3,500. Wilmer Flores, probably the most consistent hitter on the team at 4,100. That's perfectly playable. He's got dual eligibility first and third base. Um, JD Davis has a lot of power as well. He's third base. So you can't play all these guys together, but you can mix in some pieces here. And again, Andrew Heaney is going to come in. I'm showing him at, at about 30% ownership right there in line with Lance Lynn and Jose Suarez and Hunter Brown. So there's going to be about five chalk spots, six chalk spots today on the mound that, you know, it, it they're, they're still attackable. So there are a lot of different ways you can go. As I mentioned, you know, kind of when we got started, there's a lot of interesting pivots that you can make. You could, you could throw up and, and play Martin Perez against Houston. If, if you really want to, you know, you can play Logan Webb against Dodgers if you really want to. Um, do you need to, you know, probably not because there's some other hedge spots that you can get to, or some leverage spots that you can get to. Um, but I'm kind of with you. I, I'm not totally sure how I want to approach this last game. Uh, I think my favorites would be not necessarily playing Logan Webb, but probably not playing Andrew Heaney either. And maybe getting to a Wilmer Flores, Evan Longoria, a little two man on the other side. Um, if I'm like, I think that's playable in 20 max for sure. And that's right. So this, so this is what we're going to do. So give me, um, just for fun, then we'll leave. Uh, give, give me your, your, okay. So we're going to do, do two things. I want gun to your head pitcher, meaning like you have to play one pitcher and he's got to perform. And then one pitcher that's going to be 
And then I want one that's going to be less than, uh, you know, let one, one off the board pitcher. Then I want one stack under your head and one off the board stack. All right. Um, well, I'll just start with the stacks. Uh, gun to my head stack. I mean, it, it just has to be the angels. I think, I think the, I think the spot is, it's just too good. And Fletcher and Trout just make it, make it workable. They make the team playable. And Tyler Alexander, like, he's just not going to beat him. He also just saw him two starts ago, you know. So that that plays uh, plays up upside for hitters just in general. Um, so if I just got to eat something, I, I would rather eat the full stack of the Angels, I think, um, which is kind of counterintuitive to how you want to do it usually. You usually want to do that with pitchers. But uh, so that would be my, my you know, gun to the head stack. If I want to get a little bit off the board with a full stack, I do like Seattle a little bit. You get a lot of leverage on the field, um, and this is a good baseball team. They're still in a playoff hunt up there. So um, I guess maybe third for me would uh, would be the Padres. Um, yeah. And what about and, pitching? And, and the pitching, I, I think gun to your head, you just play Blake Snell and don't watch a game. I, just, I hope he doesn't watch – uh, walk the whole country yeah um and then hunter brown of course after that off the board oh yeah yeah um it's really really gross but i think both brady singer and martin perez are kind of in that 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 tier right there with a logan webb kind of a, a distant third for me yeah I'll, I'll go um i'll go snell as well uh my pitcher um I will go uh, off the board pitcher. I will say uh, Brady Singer. Um, as far as uh, uh, stacks go, I think uh, my top one is San Diego. And then uh, off the board, I would say, um, um, I guess it would kind of have to be San Francisco, um, just in case. So that would be it. Uh, uh, thanks, Justin. You are the man. I will put this up on the site. Good luck, everybody, and uh, let's get it. Good luck, guys. All right, later. Thanks. Later.